everyone and welcome back to another virtual farm tour. I'm here in our cow and calf pen so we're going to take a quick tour around uh, this pen here and see all the new calves that have been born since Sunday and then we're going to go off to the sheep pen check out the ewes that are about to lamb in the next couple of weeks so we can see how much they're uh, starting to really show their pregnancy but I'll flip the camera around and we can see the new calves so we've moved most of the cattle out of this pen and we've also drained uh, all, a lot of the water out of here. It's been very warm and it, a lot of the snow has been melting so we've um, been using one of our pumps just to get the water out of this pen so it can dry out a little bit. And then we've moved all the cows and most of the calves over into one of the other pens. So these are just the cows and calves that have been born in the last couple of days. We'll start over here with this little guy. They're very spunky. Uh, these calves are able to stand after they've been born. So about 15 minutes to 20 minutes after they've been born, they're able to get up and stand. They're going to be a little bit shaky, but they're still able to move about and follow their mother just shortly after birth. But these calves are all a couple of days old, so they've got their legs under them and they're able to move very quickly. This is one of our oldest cows here. Uh, we bought her when we purchased our neighbor's herd. They had a dispersal, so that means that they wanted to get out of having cattle and just farm grain. So we bought their herd, which was uh, mostly Maine and Jew cattle and we added them to our herd. So when we brought them over, we just walked them down the road and added them to the rest of our, our herd. Here's Hershey, here's our bottle calf who is no longer a bottle calf actually. We had a cow that unfortunately lost her calf and we had Hershey as our last remaining bottle baby. So we paired them together and they're bonding nicely. So. No more bottle feeding for him for now. He has, uh, he has a mother to do that. So he's not as pushy with me as he usually is, but he's still very friendly and he'll still appreciate some good scratches. They really enjoy being scratched right under the neck and especially uh, the calves aren't able to rub up against anything. They're not quite big enough yet to reach anything that'll get right under their neck. So in, uh, in their little lives, their, their mothers would do that for them. Instead of sort of scratching, the cows would lick underneath their necks. So that's what this is simulating for him. But now he has a mom to do that. So he can get lots of rubs and lots of attention far more regularly than we were able to give him and he's very happy about it. You can also see he has a kind of a bald spot on his head and it's kind of like what babies have when you set them down on the back of their heads they get a little bit of a a little bit of a bald spot but his bald spot is from rubbing up against the door and also rubbing up against us. So <laughs> you can see how much attention he was giving us just by that bald spot right there. So I'm just going to clean my lens. I think it was in my pocket a bit too long and it got a bit dirty. So pardon my finger. There we go. That's a lot better. So as you can see, Hershey is stretching right now and we'll try and get him as he's stretching. So he has his back arched and he has his tail up and his neck's down. And if you were to look this way, he's going to give himself a little bit of a lick on the tail. So this, these are all excellent signs when we're checking our calves, which we do very regularly. Um, every, every day, twice a day, especially the calves that are recently born, we want to see them get up, stretch, arch their back. Those are all signs of a healthy, happy calf. And you can see he's following me a little bit. He still knows that only a couple of days ago, we were the ones who were feeding him but now he has his cow so he'll be all right but he still enjoys the attention 
even when he'll be a couple of months old and he'll be used to nursing with the cow, we'll still be able to go up to him in the pasture and he'll stand for us and enjoy a few scratches. And depending on the animal, um, they have particular spots on their, on their body that they enjoy. Just like people, some people might be really ticklish on their feet or around their neck, so you don't really like being um, touched there that much. And it's the same with cattle. Depending on their preference, they'll have specific spots that they'll let you um, touch them or scratch them on. Whereas Hershey doesn't seem to mind anywhere I go. So I can go along his back and he'll arch his back. And then I'll go up to his behind his ears and usually the ears are a very sensitive spot and you can see he's being a little bit he's telling me he doesn't really like that too much but right by his neck he enjoys that and then under his neck he stretches it out all the way and he'll just stand as I scratch him there we go it's enough attention for him for now So these are the rest of the cows and calves that are in here. Some of them are a few, whoop, and we have the dog. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. So much attention. So exciting. Um, say hi to Hershey. And the cows aren't too much of a, a fan of the dog. But we'll mosey around here. So we have our two different color tagging systems. So the calves with these yellow tags are our heifer calves. And then the calves with these blue tags, uh, the same color tag that Hershey has, those are our bull calves. So that's how we uh, distinguish the the different sexes and it's important for us to tag them because especially when you have calves that look very similar a lot of them are black they all are very similar in size and shape it's really hard to tell the difference between all of them especially when you get around 200 so giving them tags is our way to make sure that we're able to keep track of them and keep track of which ones are healthy or which ones are maybe needing a little bit extra attention. Calves often get pneumonia, especially when they're fluctuating temperatures. So making sure we're keeping an eye on the calves and tracking whether or not they're healthy or sick. And if we have to bring them in for some treatment. A bunch of our cattle also got their hooves trimmed today. So we can go over and check out and see that. It's just like um, people getting a, a manicure or a pedicure. It doesn't hurt them at all. It's the same, same type of material that your fingernails are made out of. But usually the sensation and sometimes the noise can be a little bit unnerving for the animals, especially if they've never had their hooves trimmed before. So we make sure we put them in a safe and secure space and then we get their hooves trimmed and once they realize that it doesn't hurt at all they don't mind having their hooves trimmed at all and it doesn't take very long so here's a calf with a really nice little piece of white on on his face and it pretty much mimics his mother so his is a little bit split in two parts where hers is connected and off to the one side but very similar so when you're looking at them out in the pasture you'd be able to say mm, they're a pair and then over here um, we had this cow in here before but she's in here again. This is Snowbell. This is one of the cows that we actually have a name for. She was born in 2006. So she's one of our oldest cows that we have here that we raised. And we actually had her one year as a milk cow. So she lost her calf and we kept milking her just in case we needed her as a, as a, an extra mother in case we had twins or something like that. 
but we didn't end up uh, putting any calves on her, so we just kept milking her for the rest of the year. So we got fantastic butter and uh, cream, and we made some cottage cheese. And so Snowbell is a shorthorn cross. We're not exactly sure what her mother was. She was a crossbred herself. And we bought six um, females initially from the local auction mart. And they were the base of our second herd when we rebuilt after the drought in 2002. And then BSE. This is Snowbell. And she also enjoy scratches shows so she'll let me come up here and uh right at the tail head is really one of their favorite places to be scratched and right now you can see she has a lot of hair coming off her the cattle are shedding the dogs are shedding there's a lot of extra hair floating around in the air right now and sometimes the cows over the winter will also develop dandruff just like people they'll get dry and in the case of any uh, show cattle if any 4-H members are prepping their animals for 4-H or for shows throughout the year and if your animal has a little bit of dry skin uh, one of the common shampoos to use to kind of remedy that is head and shoulders it works for people and it works for cattle just as well so we have another um, short horn cross cow in here so she's one of our older ones as well not quite as old as snowbell but getting up there and so this is a look at our calf shed so i'm able to actually back up a little bit more and give you a better wide angle view of what this looks like before when i was doing a lot of the tours we had a lot of cattle in here and so backing up kind of would have been impossible because they all would have been in my way so right now you're able to see these are the calf sheds so they have that bar or the wooden plank across the front and so that prevents the cows from getting in there and getting shelter and only lets the calves go in there so it protects them from the wind the rain the snow if there's any which there has been and the calves are able to go in here when we um, give fresh straw to the cattle. We add extra in here and then we'll fork it around to make sure the calves have a nice bed. So those are all the calves in here so far. So we're gonna move off and go into our sheep pen. They're a little bit on the further side of our yard and it's quite mucky, so I'm not going to completely dash over there and get mud everywhere. So we're gonna slowly walk through all the water and as we get there, hopefully the geese will be in uh, some of the puddles that are around and we can go take a look at them. On our farm, we have a total number uh, of 200 head of cattle or 200 head of cows and calves and then that doesn't include any of the replacement heifers so the yearling heifers our bulls and then uh, a few steers that we're keeping so i'm gonna flip this around so you can see all the mud so we've drained a lot of this water out of here but today's been an excellent day for sun and warm weather so there's a lot of mud everywhere. But a lot of mud and a lot of water means a lot of great moisture for um, grass to grow and any of our seeding that we're going to be doing. I know last year at this time we had little to any uh, water or moisture. so. Even though it's a little bit mucky, it's never a bad thing. We can just kind of move the water over into a place that it's better suited for, out of the way, and uh, get it over onto the side. So the ducks and geese are to the left of me. None of them are really in any of the puddles. 
So I'm trying to find, most of them are over here. So the ducks and geese have really been enjoying the, the water, the extra mud. They enjoy sifting through the water and the mud with their bills so they're able to pick out any um, grasses or seeds. And the geese are enjoying all this extra grass that's being exposed as the sun's starting to melt everything. And geese, unlike ducks, are more grazers, so they feed in a very similar way that uh, cattle and sheep do. So that's, you'll often see geese on golf courses and they'll be eating the grass, so they graze. Where ducks, and the ducks that I have, they sift their food, so they will filter it through their bills and they will find any of the, the grains or the seeds or the little aquatic um, insects and so they'll eat those whereas ducks like grass and they'll kind of move in a similar pattern to sheep and cattle as well. So I'm going to walk over in a spot where a little less muddy, a little easier to walk. And we have some followers. This is our livestock guardian dog Lizzie. She's a great Pyrenees and just over a year old. She turned a year in February and she's ever busy making sure that the perimeter of the farmyard is safe, making sure no deer or coyotes or foxes come anywhere near the sheep, the cattle or the chickens. But one of the, in the most interesting things that we've sort of learned about Lizzie so far this year was when she was a puppy, she loved the water. We would find her in the watering bowls. We would find her in all the puddles. She would come back looking um, rather brown and black rather than white. And now that she's got a little bit older and we have all this mud and water around, she's very timid about where she walks and she's quite concerned about getting dirty. So we're not quite sure what happened. I guess she grew up and decided that being dirty isn't the thing to do. So she's been uh, having a little bit of a tough time walking around the yard with all this mud. But anyway, these are our sheep. Um, the sheep that have the white faces are South Down Cross. And then the sheep, the two that have the darker faces, so the kind of um, brown and white faces, those are Suffolk Cross. And those two are, are our weathers. So weathers are castrated males. And then the rest of these in here are females. And female sheep are called ewes. Um, male breeding sheep are called rams. And then once they are born, they are called um, lambs. So ewes uh, have a lambing season. And then you can have ewe lambs and ram lambs. So the sheep are quite pushy. They're actually more difficult to feed than the, than the cattle are. They really enjoy their grain and it is quite the challenge to come in here and feed them just doing that. Adding uh, some camera work in here is an additional challenge. So I'm giving them some rolled barley as a treat. They really enjoy that. And they don't get too much, just enough that they can all grab it. And the sheep will jump up in the trough. They don't really have a lot of manners. But that's all right. So we're going to try and take an above um, view of these ewes. So some of them will be, it'll be easier to see than others. So this ewe is a perfect representation of what a pregnant sheep looks like. So she still has all her um, wool growth from last year. So we would have um, sheared all of our sheep last year around this time. This year, because it has been the never ending winter, um, we've been busy with a lot of other things and it's okay for them to keep their wool for a little bit. Uh, but we will try and get them sheared right before they lamb. But you can see she's, she's really starting to look full. She's really looking to, um, she's really looking pregnant where a few of the others 
carry themselves a little bit differently. So this you right here is is pretty round, but she's a little bit deeper. She's carrying her lambs a little bit lower on her body than the other you before. She's carrying them a little bit more to the side. The gestation period for our sheep is around 147 days. So our ewes were bred in December and then they will lamb the beginning of May. So we're getting pretty close. We'll move a little uh, calf shed into this pen here and so the ewes are able to go in there as well. We'll split it off so we'll add some panels in there to make some individual pens so the ewes can bond with their lambs. Same type of thing that we have in with the cattle, just a bit of a smaller scale. And also what we'll do with the sheep because sheep tend to have uh, more, than one, more than one offspring at a time. So we'll use some spray paint and we'll give the mums each a number or using their existing ear tag number. So this you in front of me is number 12. So we'd spray paint uh, number 12 on her side and any of her lambs, we would spray paint them with the number 12 as well. Just so before we tag them, we're able to identify them. Because as you start to get more and more lambs, it starts to get pretty confusing because you're dealing with more than one baby and that can confuse the ewes and more times it confuses us. So just adding that extra number on those lambs gives us a quick identification. This is one of our um, Suffolk weathers. So the weathers are the castrated males and we use them um, we use them for butchering, so if we're having anyone interested in lamb, these are the ones that we will use. So that's their specific role in our herd, where the females over here are used for breeding and reproducing and uh, increasing our flock. So a bunch of sheep are called a flock, a bunch of cattle are called a herd, um, a bunch of chickens are also called a flock. And then a bunch of geese are called a gaggle. So there are a bunch of different terms for groups of animals and a lot of, and a lot of them are really quite interesting. But a lot of them are very similar. So a bunch of horses are also called a herd. And then I don't know what you'd call a bunch of cats because we have a bunch of those. So if anyone knows what you call a bunch of cats, let us know in the comments. <laughs> One of the things that as we were talking about and looking at the, at the cattle, so the cattle are shedding, the horse is shedding, um, the dog is shedding, sheep don't really shed. They don't shed at all. Depending on their breed, they will if they are hair sheep, but our sheep won't shed because they are wool sheep. And you can see this ewe kind of has some wool that's coming off here. That's only because she's been scratching on something. Other than that, there's, there's nothing coming off here. So the sheep don't shed naturally and that's why we need to shear them every year. Domestic sheep are bred to keep their wool. So you'll need the farmers around to shear that off. And once we shear that off, we keep it packaged up. We try and keep it as clean as possible. And then we take it to a um, auction mart in Tofield and we sell it there and it goes for wool and textiles. And the same thing with um, cutting your hair right now. Shearing the wool off a sheep doesn't hurt them at all. We sit them on their rump. So it's, it's in a way kind of like when a dog is sitting down. We'll get the sheep to do that. We have to grab them. They don't just do that by themselves. And we'll rock them back and we'll set them into ourself. And then we're able to shear them. And so my brother is, does a lot of the shearing. And the way he learned to do that was just watching a lot of YouTube videos. So he watched enough videos. We had the, the shears already because we use those same clippers for clipping the cattle. We just had to get a different um, blade. We have to get a blade that's a little bit 
bigger and wider because trying to shear through all this wool, there's a lot to go through. So you need something that's, that's able and up to the task. And once he starts shearing uh, sheep, depending on the size, so any one of these uh, ewes, especially the younger ones, it'll take him about uh, five to seven minutes to shear one sheep from top to bottom. And he's able to do that all by himself. We set up um, a generator and he's able to do that all by himself. It's really backbreaking work because you're leaning over the sheep the entire time, getting into all the, the nooks and crannies of their body, following their, um, following their skin. One of the things uh, that you want to make sure when you're shearing is you never pull the wool. You might think that it would make it a lot easier, but you just follow along the, the skin of the sheep and so that wool will come off very nicely. can see as we're feeding the sheep and I'll give them a bit more or we'll let them eat out of my hand for a quick minute if I can grab the pearl. Here. Sheep have a natural split in their lip and so this allows them to graze very close to the bottom of plants and trees and shrubs so they're able to get to the base and strip off all the best leaves and bark. And the eyes of the sheep are very different in comparison to cattle. They're a bit more like cat eyes. So you can see they're quite yellow around the outside and then that middle iris part is very elongated. And different. So. There are a lot of similarities between cattle and sheep, but then there are a lot of differences as well. So we're getting a lot of comments on what you call a bunch of cats. So we have a meander of cats and a clouder of cats. So those are excellent. I would definitely say that ours are, uh, ours are a meander. They go everywhere they want and sometimes where they shouldn't. So that's excellent. Also, while everyone's on there popping on and um, commenting, let us know where you're watching from. It's been very exciting to see all the different towns and provinces and even countries. So let us know where you're watching from. Speaking of a meander of cats or cat, we have one right here. So waiting outside the pen, we got the dog and we got the cat. Lizzie, be nice, hey? <laughs> oh, poor cat. So this is also what our um, some of our sheet panels look like. So these are just set up. These were um, positioned here earlier in the year when we were moving some of the sheep around. And um, snow started to fall and things started to freeze. And now everything's been melting and freezing. So these are just staying here. But you can see how short these panels are in comparison to cattle fence. So cattle fence does nothing uh, to keep sheep in. And as you can see, the sheep just figured out where I hid the food for a second. But uh, sheep are able to duck right under the barbed wire and escape on you. So unless you have a five wire fence, um, you're not going to be able to keep sheep in with your traditional three wire or even four wire cattle fence. So they need to have specific fencing because they're quite short, they're very agile, and uh, they're able to slip themselves through quite a bit. So we have some of the fence in here is a little bit ratty and the reason for that is we had uh, my horse in here and she liked to push down on the fence and that kind of wrecked some of it. A more meanderings of our cats. So this is what the sheep fence look like, looks like. So it's kind of like chicken wire, but a bigger version of that. And that keeps them in. It doesn't have to be incredibly high. 
but depending on your sheep and depending on the size we have had some of our um weathers jump over that metal fencing when we had them in that pen so sheep are able to get quite a bit of height when they are moving around but when they're in their pen they're pretty good at staying in put this is also their feeder that they get everything in the the sheep world is a little bit uh, miniature in comparison to cattle so uh, this is their bale feeder exact same material exact same uh, design that we use for cattle but the bars here are spaced closer together and it's quite a bit shorter so this comes up to just right above my hips whereas the cattle uh, bale feeder comes up to right about where my shoulders are or my ears and one of the most entertaining things we find is once we start lambing the lambs will jump in here and they'll play in here and they'll lie down and they're actually quite agile and will move around a lot So the sheep get fed um, this alfalfa hay, and this is what their diet consists of throughout the throughout the winter. And it, then in the summer, we move them around to different pens, and we'll let them out for a bit so they're able to go down to any of the areas where we're needing some weed control, or we just want them to uh, eat the grass down a little bit. And sheep are excellent for that. So are goats. So in case we're needing any spaces that maybe have some thick um, bush or even some weeds that are really difficult to remove um, by hand, the sheep make really light work of it and we're able to put them in an area and they're able to clean everything up very well. But this is what they're eating for now. But I know all the animals will be very happy to see green grass. We can definitely tell with the cows when they start to get restless. They start to kind of push on the fences and, and try to see what's on the other side, even though there's no more grass on the unknown side than there is on theirs. So hopefully sometime soon all this snow will um, melt down and we can move all the animals out to their summer pastures. So probably now we can see the ewes a little bit better so we can take another look at their pregnant bellies. So this ewe right here, her wool is a little bit thicker so we're not able to see um, just the extent of how pregnant she is. She's a pre probably a little bit uh, later in her pregnancy as well so she'll probably be one of the last used to lamb but she might surprise us we can never know sheep are always um, especially the the males and the lambs they'll jump up on the backs of the others like you just saw there it's nothing um, to do with mating or anything like that they just like getting at where another sheep is they think that that's the best spot to eat in so they're going to try and get that themselves so this is another one of the ewes kind of kind of can tell she's uh, a little bit pregnant but i know that there's another one in here that's even more this is one of our weathers so he's a male so um not going to have a belly at all oh, we'll move them out of the way so this is the wenyu that's really showing her um showing how she's carrying her lambs and one of the ways that we'll be able to tell once the ewes are getting much closer, we'll start to see that their udders are filling with milk, um, that they start to be a little bit more, uh, they, they kind of nest in a way. They'll pick a spot in the pen or in the calf shed that they're kind of making a nest. So those are some of the signs that we use to determine um, when we should start watching out for lambs as we get close. 
So I can't believe it's already the middle of April, so the lambs will be here very soon. So I'll make sure that we do some uh, live tours of when that happens since they are, they're cute. I know the calves are very cute, but lambs, there's not a lot cuter than some newborn lambs. So make sure you all tune in for that. Uh, we are pretty much done with the tour today. I'll walk back over to uh, the chicken house and we can see if the geese are um, back over there a little bit more. We can go check out the chickens. Everything's been melting around where the hen house is, so I've been able to let them out. Not that we can't let them out earlier. The hens actually don't like being in the, in the snow and all the mud, so it's kind of... Um, their own choice not to go outside where the ducks and geese don't have a problem with being in the the mud and sometimes the cold so we're gonna get the dog and the cats to follow us back and if anyone has any questions please let me know um, you can write them up in the comments and I will try to do my best to answer them as we're getting to the end swap this around again. I always have to take my gloves on and off. It's not too bad today, but it can be a little chilly. So this is one of the main pathways that we have to our yard. And so these puddles right here are usually filled with filled with geese depending on the day or depending on the hour of the day and they kind of split up into groups and they'll just mosey around the yard you can see they're kind of um, sifting their bills through the mud and through the water trying to pick up any bits of grass any seeds or any grain that's been left behind. In addition to um, all the, the cattle and the sheep, the ducks and geese and chickens, we do grow crops. Uh, one of our um, main um, cereal grains would be wheat and barley, so we grow that quite often. I'm not quite sure what we're what the plan is for this year's seeding and it's been a little bit delayed since there's still a lot of snow on the ground and depending on the year some farmers start seeding the first couple of weeks in May. We also seed um, barley which we use as green feed so we cut that um, right after it begins to um, it's still nice and green but all the the seeds so all the oat um, seeds have started to get really full and get to the point um, just before they mature. So we cut that for feed for the cattle. Um, depending on the year, we'll also grow some flax. Um, and then the, the hay that we saw in with the sheep, that's alfalfa. So we have a number of alfalfa fields. So alfalfa is a legume and uh, in with the alfalfa is usually some, some brome or some fescue grass and that's what makes up the hay that we feed to the cattle. So we'll usually get two cuts of that um, alfalfa or that grass throughout the summer. We cut it, it dries, and then we bale it. And so we'll try and do that uh, twice throughout the summer. Um, I'm trying to think, I went through, we have wheat, barley, um, flax, oats, uh, peas. Peas can be a little bit tricky to um, harvest. They grow very well, but then they get to be a bit of a pain at harvesting time because if anyone has grown peas themselves at home in your garden, you'll notice that by the end when peas mature, they flop down and they get very close to the ground. So that can make harvesting a, a real challenge and you have to have a very um, specific um, combine header to properly um, harvest that. Uh, what else is there? I think that's pretty much it that we do. Um, one of the other 
crops that my brothers tried out for the first time last year was corn. So they're hoping to do that again. And what we used the corn for was uh, corn silage. And uh, we're getting to the end of our uh, silage pit. It's been a, a great feed for the cattle throughout the throughout the winter and they've seemed to really enjoy it. The chickens also enjoy it a lot since a lot of the corn kernels are left um, in the silage even though it's been chopped up into very uh, small pieces. Uh, the geese. Sorry Patty, I should have answered that when I was over there but I do see that there's some more far over there. But the geese I have are Toulouse uh, geese. They're a, a French breed so they're one of the uh, medium to large size geese that that you can get so they are a domestic breed and uh, I have 15 right now and approximately seven of my females are laying I'm not exactly sure how many females I have since um, both male and females in the Toulouse breed are uh, similar size similar shape similar color the males will be slightly bigger, but depending on the, the age and the maturity, um, they can be just about the same size. So I'm in the um, goose and duck barn right now. So this is one of the goose nests, and she's actually built it up quite a bit since we were in here on Sunday. So you can see it, it really does have the shape and form of a nest. And uh, the geese will start to pull out feathers from their breast and they'll line the nest. So we have three eggs in here currently right now. And then we have one more female in here who she was in here from before. Uh, we'll see if she's in here again. So we're going to be a little sneaky. And we'll see if we can see her. You can definitely hear her. So if you listen very carefully, you can hear this eerie sounding hissing. And the cat just figured out she's there. We'll walk around the other side and we'll see if she'll stay for us. So if you look carefully at the back, and now she's showing her, showing us her face. So this, uh, this mother goose is sitting on three eggs right now. So she's just started the incubation. And goose eggs will take around uh, 32 days, depending on the breed and depending on uh, temperatures within the barn it can be a little bit variable. And the goose eggs, what I've been doing since I've been getting a good number, I was getting uh, close to five eggs a day most times. Uh, I was having a lot of customers interested in hatching eggs, so hatching them out for themselves. So uh, doing that for a lot of customers. And then I also have one customer who does pisanka, which is uh, traditional Easter egg, um, Ukrainian Easter egg decorating. So she took the goose eggs for that. And then we do use them for um, cooking and baking, especially um, goose eggs are, are very rich. So they make excellent cakes and cookies and desserts. I don't really use them for eating as much. They have a, they have a much stronger taste and there's nothing um, wrong with that taste. It's just a little bit different and it's far more suited in my opinion for baking. They make, they really do make um, excellent cakes and pastries. So as the cat gets a little closer, she might pop up. But the geese will stay very still and very quiet. Um, she knows that we're not so much a, a concern, but just in case anything came in here that she's not used to, she would get quite aggressive and come after that thing, whether it was uh, uh, a cat she's not used to, <laughs> just like that. Um, 
or even anything else. So they're very protective mothers and they're very good mothers. So we'll leave her alone for now. It can get quite, there's a lot going on for her. So Lizzie out, come on, everybody out. We got a lot in there for her, so we'll pop out. So here we have some of the, the ducks. They're all quite muddy, but they're enjoying the, enjoying the water. Perfect weather for ducks. And we got the cats. And the dog. And then we got, and then we have uh, one more of my uh, ganders over here. So the female ducks are called hens um, and the males are called ganders. So this one looks very similar to uh, a wild mallard duck, um, but this is a domestic breed. These are my Ruens. So they would have been originally um, bred from mallards. So once upon a time when they were being first developed. And then I have one more duck who's all the way at the back and he's white, so he's a, a Pekin duck. Take a look over here. And we can see a little bit of a mess with all the mud and everything, but... Oh, I think I said gander for the ducks. Sorry, the male ducks are called drakes. I've been uh, focusing on the, the geese so much. Um, male ducks are called drakes, uh, male geese are called ganders, female geese are called uh, just a goose, and then um, female ducks are called hens, and so are chickens. So the females are the hens, the males are the roosters, and then if you have any young females, those are called pullets, so any of the females that haven't started laying yet, um, any of the young males are called cockerels. And then the babies are called chicks. I hope everyone has enjoyed the tour so far. We're going to do a, another one on Sunday. So join in then and hopefully we'll have some uh, more new calves. We're getting to the end of our um, calving season. Most of our cows have already had their calves. So it's getting a bit few and far between as far as um, any new babies. But once we end with calving season, lambing season will start. So it goes from one thing to another and it's all very exciting. So please tune in on Sunday. If you have any other questions that um, you've thought of maybe afterwards or I didn't have a chance or I didn't see to answer, put them in the comments below and I'll comment afterwards with, uh, with the answers. Um, we also have our Name the Twins contest. We had two twin calves born uh, the other week. So we're doing a, a Name the Calf, co Name the Twins contest. So any names starting with the letter H, um, we have some fun prizes to give away. So make sure you um, submit your names and we're going to be doing the draw on Friday. So we're gonna get Lizzie and this nameless cat to sign us off for the video today. Thank you so much for joining us. Lizzie. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening and stay safe everybody. Bye.